My name is Jane Borowski, host of Invisible Tears. This podcast will be about my story and my words, talking about my own personal experiences in self-healing. I do not claim to be a therapist, counselor, or a licensed psychologist. Hello, my name is Amanda Bedard, and I'm the co-host, producer, and editor of Invisible Tears. I'm a Reiki master, certified professional life coach, spiritual coach, wellness coach, and a counseling practitioner. Some of the content you will hear in this podcast may be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised, but it is our hope by putting this information out there that we may help others to heal. We will always be a platform for truth and healing. Brought to you by Glassbox Media, this is Invisible Tears. Welcome to Invisible Tears. Thank you for coming and listening and watching, technically. (laughs) I'm here with my co-host, Amanda, and my co-host, Drew. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey, Jane. Hey, Drew. How are you guys doing today? It's been a long week. (laughs) I was going to say, Jane, how are you doing after? It's been a long week. It has. You know, we did the the whole uh, gathering on Monday with everybody and then Tuesday was the march and yesterday I woke up not feeling well not at all but I feel a little better today a little dizzy a little nauseous but I feel better so let's start talking about exactly what we were doing with the march do you want to start from the beginning Amanda on how we started getting everybody together and yeah Absolutely. So you guys have been listening to us and hearing us talk about this march um, for a little bit now. What's interesting is to really put it into perspective, a coalition ended up being formed out of this gathering of the minds and out of this event that we scheduled was just this past August 15th up in Concord, New Hampshire. We all initially just connected because we were trying to support one another and we're trying to understand each other's cases. We are trying to be really a part of everybody's support system for their advocacy journey, considering we're on an advocacy journey as well. And what that ended up turning into was this force, really. And we very quickly realized that we needed to officially form Um, And we're definitely still in the early stages of that. But we essentially actually all threw this together in about two and a half months, which is crazy when you actually think about it. So the the gathering of people was really just, you know, myself and Jane, obviously, Julie Murray, um, Valerie Haynes Alvarez, Chloe French, Carrie Ann Wilson. And then we also ended up connecting with an amazing organization, Light the Way, um, Shana and Tates. They previously knew Julie from previous like efforts that they had put in and, and connected with her and organized with her. And they really were instrumental in helping us um, sort of come together helping us make some graphics, some visuals, and that sort of thing. They made brochures for us. They're going to be making a website as well. So I think in just the short period of time that we were able to organize and form this event, it really just sort of goes to show that there is hope in numbers. I think there was a pretty clear consensus with everyone that they were alone on their journey. And we consistently heard that from people at the march as well, that they thought that they were alone as well. And they really felt alone. And I think that it was nice for us to be able to form this group. So everybody doesn't feel alone. It feels like a movement to me, to be honest with you. Oh, it it did. It did feel like a movement to me. You know, I knew that Julie Mora Mora's um, sister, I knew that they were going to have a lot of people show up in support for them. I mean, Julie's been out there using social media and very high profile case, Morris cases. And I knew Trish's advocates and, and Trish's case was going to get a lot of support. Also, a lot of people coming out and supporting her case and everything that they're going through. I was standing there, and it was almost like out of a freaking movie. 
I had so many people coming up to me and talking to me and wanting to, you know, wanting more information and some were there to, you know, even support us. And so I was I was actually meeting up with a lot of people that I've talked to and chatted with online and actually were, were, was able to meet them in person. So I got really busy with that as um, the beginning of the day went. And then I'm standing there. And it was like I was done with conversations and Drew was standing next to me and I, I just happened to look up and I I scan the parking lot, all right? So envision scanning the parking lot with a camera. And all of a sudden you see all these people with tears in their eyes holding up signs of their loved ones that were murdered and their cases still unsolved. And that's all I saw was it wasn't just Julie Murray, uh, Maura Morris' face on those posters. It wasn't just Trisha's face on on those posters. There was so many different faces on those posters. And it's like you scan, as I was standing there and I'm looking at all these people holding these posters and it hit me like a brick wall. I was like, holy shit. Look how many people showed up so that they can advocate for their own family member at this march. Yep. And it was so overwhelming and emotional to me that it it just hit me and I I just broke I just uh I immediately started crying and I was like holy shit all these years I thought I was alone I thought I was the only one that they were treating this way I was the only one that you know, had a cold case, unsolved cold case. And um, I had these grievances with the Justice Department, with the cold case unit, with the, the AG office. And yet I, I'm, I'm realizing, I'm standing there and realizing, oh my God, I was not the only one. Right. There was so many there. It was, it was like out of a movie. Yeah. It was like out of a movie and people were vocal. Yes. And that's what I absolutely loved. Everybody had a story and everybody's case was so different. You know, Maura's case, she was she's missing. And Trisha's case, uh, she was murdered and everybody knows who murdered her. And then the Connecticut River Valley cases was a serial killer still unsolved. And there was just so many different, all these cases were so different. And yet we had the same grievances. We've all been treated the same way through the AG office. And it was a powerful day. It was a, um, an emotional day. I mean, it's unfortunate, but I never felt alone the whole day. I immediately felt connected with every single person there that day. And that was just, it was so overwhelming and so emotional. So as we're getting set up outside, we have two gentlemen that come out and meet us. Yes. And that was Mile Matson. He is the Chief Criminal Justice Bureau Senior Assistant Attorney General and Michael Garrity, Department of Justice Director of Communication. I, I was standing there and they like came over to me first and, and introduced themselves. And I was like, oh, you're Miles. You, you've been talking to Amanda. I got to go find Amanda. So as I go over to get Amanda, Chloe an advocate for um, Trish Haynes, she immediately was there and she became vocal. And then we all started becoming vocal. And then the next thing I know, media was like, woof, 
cameras and reporters and it, it got a little crazy there for a little while but everybody let everybody speak yes. you know yes i was angry with some of the things that i had to say and chloe was extremely angry with some of the things that she wanted to say and julie you know was there to to express what her concerns were and what you know how they needed to do some change and everybody was just so considerate but yet everybody really jumped in to get their point across of how we all have been treated over the years was absolutely unacceptable yeah it was interesting in that we actually didn't have technical confirmation from miles himself or and i had never spoken directly with michael garrity either we didn't actually have confirmation that they would attend. I reached out directly to them, made sure that they understood the timing of the event, what was happening, when we would be there, and really urged and, and said, if you are available, please come down and meet us. Please come down and speak with us. It'd be great to get this initial face-to-face -face, you know, connection going. And so those one-on-one -on -one conversations can move forward and it can really be a good productive, you know, uh, situation going forward. So I was actually, so it was literally like right before 11 when we were supposed to start marching, um, when they came down yeah. and then everybody just sort of gathered. And I definitely do understand that, you know, everybody had something, something to say. And so everybody was mindful and let each other speak and that sort of thing. I am both myself and I know Drew did as well. And I'm sure other people did, but, but we may just not have witnessed it. Definitely did thank Miles and Michael himself for allowing people to speak to them in just sort of like that round circle um, beforehand, understanding that some of the conversations definitely did get heated and a little emotional and colorful, but they understood that while they haven't been in their positions too long, they understood that this was the feedback that they needed to hear because that's a really good opportunity to change what is happening going forward. So I know we made sure to thank them for not just coming to the event, but actually feeling that brunt, right? They stayed throughout the entire event and listened to every single they remark did. and spoke with most all of us afterwards. They did. But we were pretty disappointed that John Framilla, the head of the AG office, was not there. That was disappointing. These two gentlemen did stand there, and they did listen to a lot. I did thank them for staying there all day and listening to us. But I kind of wonder, you know, I got to look at it with an open mind, and obviously we're going to, this isn't going to be our, our last march. We're definitely going to make sure that they're going to follow through with a, with a few things that, you know, that we want them to follow through. You know, we're all supposed to be having our one-on-one -on -one with them. They're going to be scheduling that for any families that want to have a one-on-one -on -one with them. But I kind of question how much authority does Miles and this Mike Garrity have to make changes within the attorney general's office. You know, I think the one that could make the changes and could be um, beneficial to all the victims, families, and the advocates would have been John Familla. And unfortunately, he wasn't there. You know, these gentlemen were very nice. They listened but no matter how nice they could be and how much they could listen, actions speak louder than words. And, you know, Mike Garrity is Department of Justice, Director of Communication. How much change can he really make in the AG office? You know, he's in charge of communication. Uh, I don't think he's in charge of any sort of policy that needs to have some uh, changes in the office, in the in the attorney general's office. So, I mean, as much as I appreciate him coming down and, and listening to us, he's director of communication. And I'm going to give you an example. There was this gentleman standing there 
Uh, this was after everybody was at the podium speaking, which I'm, I'm kind of jumping forward. We'll get back to that. But there was this gentleman standing there towards the end of the day. A lot of people had, had left, and he had this big white sign for Carrie Moss. Uh, so I went over and I asked him, you know, are you, were you related to Carrie Moss in some way? Because he had been there all day, and and I had yet uh, spoke to him. And he said that his wife was Carrie Moss's sister. And uh, he said, well, I just had a disturbing conversation with that Mike Garrity. He's um, Department of Justice, di the Director of Communication. He says, wouldn't you think he would know at least one name of one detective in the cold case unit? I was like, yeah, I would think at least one name. He's like, well, I just went up to him and asked him, can you give me a name of one detective that's in the cold case unit? And he could not. <laughs> so they went in the building, him and this Mike Garrity, went in the building and said, you know, was asking some people inside the building, the Justice Department, and nobody in there could name one, per one detective, one detective by name in the cold case unit. He said it was, it was the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. So this Mike Garrity said he was going to go and get the names of as many detectives in the cold case uh, cold case unit as he can, and he was um, going to send them to this uh, to Carrie Moss's uh, brother-in-law. I thought about that a lot that night, and I was like, okay, we want change. Obviously, this Michael Garrity, as nice as he was, I'm not going to say he wasn't, he was extremely nice, and he stayed there all day, and he listened but how much weight does he really have to change any policy in that office? Really not much. Not when he's in communications and he could not name one detective in that cold case unit. So, I mean, yeah, they were there, but we'll see what happens. I don't have a lot of uh, high expectations that Things are going to change just from this one March. I wish John Framilla was there. I really feel like uh, he would have made a big difference. But he wasn't there. He chose not to be. His exact words were the day was for the victims when in reality the day, yes, it was about the victims. But the day was also about accountability by the Attorney General's office and John Framilla. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. And you actually do bring up a good point when as you are focusing in a little bit on, you know, who has the ability and the authority to actually do what, if you actually really put it into perspective, actually, everybody within the AG's office, including the AG himself may be restrained by legislation <laughs> with some of this, w with some of the things as as well. So that really just goes back to sort of maybe zoning in on the legislative piece as well and legislators to hopefully bring about better change and change in policy in the office. That's why I feel, you know, we would have benefited a lot with John Familla being there, you know, ask him. So we could have asked him, you know, what is the policy with making change in the AG office? Does it have to go through legislation? Can you, as the head of the AG office, bring all these concerns and bring it to legislation and say, we need change in the AG office. Let's make change. But again, he wasn't there. So we don't know if, if he's able to make change or if it has to go through legislation. We don't know because John Framilla was not there, unfortunately. Over the years, I have heard you know, so many times, you know, they've just basically blown smoke up my ass and just said things that they thought that I would want to hear. So I don't know. I think I felt the same as uh, Julie and I felt the same as 
You know, Trisha's family, not a whole lot of faith. But we all got up and spoke about, you know, our grievances and our concerns and, you know, what changes needed to be made. It's funny because let's go back last week. I had had my my whole speech wrote up because I knew I was going to go up to the podium and, and speak. Had it all wrote out had it practiced, everything was good. And then uh, WMUR ran their story Monday night, just before the rally. And uh, it said that uh, John Familla wasn't going to be there because it was going to be, he wanted it to be about the victims. And then made these, all these horrendous, stupid, he did a press, sent out a press statement. And it was just so bogus. I just, uh, I think we can post that somewhere on our Facebook. Mm -hmm. It angered me so much that I stayed up all of Monday night and rewrote all my cue cards (laughs) because I was so pissed off. I was so mad. I was like, okay, now I'm changing everything of what I wanted to say. So I practiced my cue cards all the way to Concord. It was an hour and a half drive and Jessica read them to me and and I practiced them, and I, I knew exactly what I wanted to say when I got there. And um, I got up to the podium, and I did not say one freaking word that was on those cue cards. <laughs> I just was like, I, I just went in a totally different direction. But, you know, we all got to speak, and we all heard each other's stories. And... um. You know, some of them were pretty, um, pretty emotional and pretty powerful. And, um, you know, most of them were old cases, 15 plus years old and still unsolved. Some of them were missing. Some of them had stories like Trisha's story where they know who murdered their loved one, but nobody wants to prosecute it, the case. It amazes me on how many stories are are out there like that. That's like, um, now did you hear Chloe when she started talking about Harmony Montgomery? Yep. You know, at first I was like, whoa, that's like a sensitive thing like right there because I've been following her, her whole story and um, they're finally going to charge her father for her murder. And that trial starts in October And I was kind of put back at first about that. But then I thought about it. And you know what? There's so much truth in what Chloe said. I get what she says, what she meant now. You know, they've never found Harmony's body. They have yet to find Harmony's body. But they did such an in-depth investigation that they feel they have enough circumstantial evidence to charge her for her father for her murder. Now, I followed the case. I looked it up online. I did a little bit of research yesterday on it. Trisha's case has more witnesses and more circumstantial evidence and physical evidence where her body was, a part of her body was found, that... There's more evidence in Trisha's case than there is in Harmony's case, but yet they will not prosecute Trisha's case. How bizarre. Yeah. I don't get it. It goes to Chloe's point. It kind of all depends on um, who you are and how the press is actually covered Yeah, in those instances, which is basically exa- exactly what she said. It is exactly what she said. Yeah. I, I totally get what she meant by that. Harmony's case just went so, so national that New Hampshire felt like, oh, we have to do something about this case or we're going to be, you know, scrutinized by other other states. And and so they really they really dove into the whole Harmony case. But I, I'm sorry if you've got this much resource and you're diving into this one case the way you are, there's no reason why you can't dive into the this this other case that is very solvable in the same manner. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Yep. 
We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And now back to our episode. Drew, what did you think about the day? Or actually, do you want to talk about a little bit about what you organized on Monday? Do you? Yeah, exactly. It was so nice. It was. Yeah. So Monday night, the coalition, uh, for the most part, got together. It was uh, me, Amanda, Abriana, Jane, Jessica, Cheyenne, Julie Murray, Chloe French, Val Alvarez Haynes, Dana and her husband, Mark from Light the Way. And we were able to get um, Machina Arts from Keene, New Hampshire to host it. So a special thank you to uh, Jordan Scott, the owner, and then also Nicholas Snow, uh, the chef that took care of us that night. Great food and great location. It was an awesome opportunity to get everybody together um, in there. Yep, I shot some interviews with everybody that took part in the rally um, just to get some of their thoughts on different pain points they've been through with the investigations, um, what they hope to expect out of this rally and also what their thoughts are on this coalition coming together. Um, so we're hopefully going to be putting out some more content related to that. If you do happen to follow us on Facebook, we do actually, we did just put out a GoFundMe to help fund this documentary that we're putting together. So if you do want to support us further, please, please help out any way possible. Yep. Support the production of the documentary itself. Yeah. Yeah. And with that too, we also did capture the, uh, the rally with also audio too. And you're actually going to be hearing that before you hear this episode, because we'll be putting it out as an early release. So everybody can actually see and hear the rally that Jane and all these other wonderful people took, you know, took part in. Yep. It's mainly the, j- just the podium remarks. Just the um, podium remarks. Yep. yep. Because we were actually able to capture clean audio for that. So awesome. That's awesome. And we might be putting out some of the uh, media scrum that happened beforehand as well um, for extra content. Cause there was some, interesting conversations going on there and interesting back and forth, not necessarily with the advocates in the AG's office, but advocates and members of the media. So you can definitely hear and see some of that. What was interesting about that interaction was I was specifically paying attention to that publication. And so that would actually be the Concord Monitor. I I was specifically paying attention to, I mean, don't get me wrong, we'll make sure and list all the rest of the media outlets that were there and all the fantastic coverage that they did um, too. But specifically with the Concord Monitor, I really wanted to see uh, what publication they would actually put out. And I have to be honest with you, the publication that they actually put out um, right after the rally was a great publication. So it was a great article. Other great people that uh, picked it up. So Amy Cavino from WMUR, uh, she's absolutely fantastic. Um, And they put out constant, constant uh, different uh, live feeds from us too. Boston 25, Bob Ward was there. Um, It was great to meet him. And then also the Concord Patch they put out a yeah. fantastic article. Um, Absolutely. It, it was yep. really in depth. Um, and we really appreciate uh, that coverage as well. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to reach out directly to that uh, to that reporter. I really love the way that they they covered the event. And they were the yeah. one that actually did go to the um, to the governor to get a comment on yes. this yeah. rally and if any changes would be made to the AG's office. Yeah, I I really did like their their article. Um, I have not read the the Concord Monitor yet. The Monitor, I was surprised that they didn't bash Chloe, and they actually handled it professionally. I was. Ah, uh, they weren't very professional at the. Uh, not at the at rally. The rally. Not at the rally. No, but when the article not at all. Came out, I was, I was surprised. It was. It was a professional article. Yep. I was hoping to see the uh, quote. Fuck you, Chloe French, F R E N C H. Yeah, I mean, as she was explaining to us afterwards, so before we did the actual, you know, remarks at the podium, we did do a small march, you know, essentially like down the one way street. And it was pretty important, you know, with the advocates that, you know, sort of like Jane, Julie, you know, myself, Chloe, Val, like everybody sort of be like in the front, like leading the group. And while Chloe was, within and right next to us, she kept on getting badgered by a reporter specifically asking her exactly what things he had done wrong in a previous article. And so she just gave him, you know, a very distinct quote and spelled her last name for him to, (laughs) to get him to just stop. (laughs) 
to stop. She was in the middle of doing something. So, yeah. His other article, his last article that he did before, um, like announcing the march and announcing the rally, you know, we did appreciate that he took the time to get that out there. What we didn't appreciate was there was so much misinformation. There was a lot of misinformation with the address. There was misinformation um, with our names. There was misinformation about some of the some of my interview with him, you know, and he recorded it, the interview I had with him. And he still kind of got some of it like twisted around. And um, there was just a lot of misinformation. And, you know, was it intentional? I'm sure it wasn't intentional, but my gosh, it was so um, unprofessionally wrote. Uh, my name was misspelled several times in there. Once in a while, he get my name right. A couple of times, he did not. Um, the locations he got wrong. There was just a lot of misinformation. He, uh, yeah, could have done better. And uh, it, it, Chloe was... <laughs> She was in his face. She was like, I am not going to stand here and argue with you. She spoke right up to him. And I can remember I was standing there. There was me and then that reporter from the Concord Monitor. And then there was Miles standing there. Everybody was like in a circle trying to talk to Miles and, and Mike Garrity. And... Chloe was on the other side of Mike, and uh, Julie Murray was there standing beside, or a couple of places beside me. And so as we're trying to get, you know, our concerns and, and our grievances out to these two gentlemen, here this reporter from the Concord Monitor <laughs> is like, just felt the need to stand there and argue with Chloe, and he would not stop. And finally, I hear somebody behind me saying, are you seriously arguing with her? And, and he just would not stop until she, he said, what's your name? And she says, fuck you. Chloe French, F-R-E-N-C-H. Yeah, it was like, you want a quote? Here's my quote. Here's a fucking quote. Get it right this time. <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. I was like, ooh, you go, Chloe. I know. But there was another um, um, article. Uh, I think it was the patch that actually called this reporter out by name and talked about the communication that him and Chloe had. And so that was pretty good that that reporter uh, from the patch uh, put that in there. I was I was happy to see that because I love that article. That article is really good. Yeah. Big shout out to them. Uh, next time we do a march or something, we're going to definitely uh, do a shout out to them and, and uh, reach out to them and have them, um, yeah, attend, hopefully. Yeah, because I, I was very pleased with them. And Amy Camino did a great job, and she's obviously going to do follow-up. Uh, she wants to know from everybody, you know, you're supposed to have your one-on-ones. Let us know that you had them. If you didn't, we're going we're gonna to readdress this for a story so Amy was awesome and um I'll let you know what's going on Amy <laughs> definitely so yeah it was a it was a perfect day it was a perfect march it was a perfect rally I think we got our voices heard we spoke very loudly and yet you know we all had something to say and we said it and uh I was looking back um I, I was trying to do some more research on, um, you know, rallies and marches and stuff like that in uh, New Hampshire. And that was actually the very first rally or march done at the Justice Department to address the AG office. I mean, yes, Trish has her rallies. They have rallies for Trish every year. But this was the first actual march done up in Concord to the AG's office. And uh, I was like, wow, well, I don't imagine it's going to be the last. I don't either. I think all in all, 
the day definitely did have some successful aspects to it. Uh, number one, at least just getting them down there to listen. Again, as you noted, actions speak louder than words. So now the the onward communication and the one-on-ones to make sure that people are actually communicating uh, with the AG back and forth will be important. The show of support from um, other people that we didn't, you know, all the, all the other supporters and all the other advocates that yeah. we didn't know previously that actually showed up, even given the weather, it wasn't exactly the perfect <laughs> weather for for us either. We had to frantically uh, adjust logistics uh, and make sure that we had tents. So the electric, so the PA system wouldn't fry. Um, so we talked about in the beginning what success would look like and I think definitely some of those pieces of success were accomplished. Obviously, there's momentum in this and going forward, we need to make sure and keep the momentum and and go forward with it to really um, make sure that communication stays there. One of the interesting things that I noted too, which was extremely powerful, was even after our event... I'm not sure if you read the email that came in from Julie right after our event, Jane, but even people, there were three different people that messaged into the New Hampshire Unsolved with their own specific cases too. I did. The feedback of that, I think too, was extremely powerful. I think it's clear that people have felt alone in their advocacy journey. And so I think the power of the support system and with us organizing is really only going to be beneficial, not just for getting things accomplished in cases, but for the mental health of people as well yeah. in the state. And I, th- I think that's a, that's a pretty um, a big accomplishment too. Oh yeah. I mean, there were families that drove up from Tennessee, mm-hmm. Tennessee, yep, just so that they could get their stories out there and be involved and in, so that they could share their grievance with the the AG office. I I was just like in shock. Oh, and we can't forget to big shout out to uh the crawl space team, Jen, Tim and Lance. They were there helping us capture some some footage as well. I mean, it wasn't just about the footage to them either. They they would have come and and supported um the event and the day. Uh, but big shout out to them for traveling in as well. Yeah. Yeah, and then there was also um Angela, oh, I don't know how to say her name. From Crime of the Crime of the Truest Kind. And then Kristen from Murder, She Told. Yeah, Kristen come from um, Maine. So that was pretty, pretty nice of, for them to, you know, come down and support us. But Drew, you and um, you and Obs were absolutely fabulous at that, that rally. It was like every once in a while I see you guys going around because I knew you were there. But it was almost like you were just like all totally behind the scenes. Like you and Ob's just were so professional about everything. You know, I knew you guys were there, but you guys were just um, going around and just capturing like so much stuff uh, without being so noticeable, I guess is what I want to say. I, I've dealt with a lot of media and a lot of stuff like that over the years and uh they're always usually like in your face yep following you around every time you turn around da 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 you and you and obs were just so professional about everything now did you get to go around and do any little interviews with the other people that that were there that weren't there on monday night i didn't unfortunately no no that's one thing i did miss out on so Hopefully quite a few of the people took advantage of the contact list. That yeah, we we've had. got the we've got the contact list. So I've got the emails of 22 different people um, and yeah, going to be reaching out to them individually just to get them on here to tell the story of their loved ones and to, just to highlight too how much of the same grievances every single family is having, regardless of the background, regardless of what happened to their loved one, it seems like. You all are going through the same pain points, and we definitely want to keep on highlighting that. And that's going to be the, you know, the um, the story behind the documentary is just really highlighting just the pain points and just the the roadblocks each and every single one of you, you know, have hit. And it's, and Jane, 
I know right after you got done speaking, you were right. You turned to me and you're like, I wasn't the only one. And I could see you really had that realization of, yeah, when we were talking with Chloe and Julie, you're like, okay, there's, you know, two other cases that have dealt with the same stuff. But then there you're like, here's a dozen cases thrown in my face where they've all been treated the same way as you have. And it really brought that to a realization, even for myself too, going, wow, there's so many more other people that have dealt with this. Yeah. I mean, the only way I could describe it is like it was out of a movie. Could not have wrote that script any better because it was uh, it was very clear to me at that moment that what we were doing up there was the right thing and it was something that had needed to be done for a long, long time. Yep. You know, feel the dreams. <laughs> if you yes. build it, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's all I could think about. If you build it, they will come. And all of a sudden, we form this little coalition and get it out there in the news. And all of a sudden, they're coming. Yeah. And um, a lot of people, you know, came up to me. um, We need a, a platform where everybody can go and talk and share our grievances and share our stories and give updates and uh, go for information and go to ask questions and maybe somebody has the answers and stuff. And so Shane is doing the website and we're going to make that the go-to place where people can go and share their stories or find information or do another rally, do another march. I don't believe that we're going to, this is going to be our last one by no means. Well, I don't think so either. I think with the website, it'll be important as a central place for people to go for help as yeah. well. It, it's very clear that people within the state of New Hampshire need help with advocating for the cases that they're advocating for, the unsolved cases. Yeah. I mean, for those of you that, that are really kind of unsure about all our grievances and stuff, a, a lot of our same grievances was that we complained about that we want to change with is... Answer a freaking email that's sent to you. <laughs> if you get an email in the AG office, all we're asking is a return email, you know, with an answer. Um, when you call up there, most of the time you get their voicemails. You know, listen to your voicemails and call us back. You know, that's not asking for very much. More communication, better communication, a little bit more transparency. You know, th- those are just some of the very common, I think almost everybody had those same grievances. You know, location of case files. I mean, if you are a victim or you are a you are an advocate for a family member that was murdered, and the case is unsolved in New Hampshire, for one, you should know where that case file is. Whether it's located in the cold case unit, it's located in the AG office, or with the state police, you should know where that case file is, for one. For two, you should always know when and who is actively working on that case. Simple as that. If my case is in the cold case unit and this new detective comes in and says, oh, I want to put new eyes on this case. I want to, you know, reinvestigate this case or look into this case a little bit more or, or whatever. That detective should in one way or another notify me and say, oh, by the way, I'm reviewing your case file right now. I'm not I'm not making any promises that anything's going to come of it. Uh, you know, nothing may come of it. I may find something, but I just want you to know that I'm reviewing your case file. That is all we're asking. And every single person should be notified when a case file is being reviewed. And that was some of that was another one of the the grievances that we had up there. We should all have info on if somebody comes forward with tips, we should have info on where to direct these people to give those tips (laughs) Um, uh, so that they can be looked into. 
These are very simple requests that we were all making up in Concord. And um, these were all the same grievances that everybody was having up there. So that's just a, a brief um, description on what our grievances were and why we went there. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. And now back to our episode. Drew, you were listening to a lot of what was going on. Do you feel that Miles and Mike Garrity were the right two to send out? Besides Formella coming out, yeah, he obviously would have been the number one. But as far as Miles, definitely seems like if Formella's not the one to come out, he would be the one to actually come out there. And then with Mike Garrity being the you know, the director of communications, knowing that the media is out there. Um, he basically him being the one that put out the press release, you know, the night before on WMUR, he might've been the one, bes- you know, besides miles, those two might've been the two that knew the most about this rally, why it was happening. Yeah. Just to explain the structure real quick, because Mike actually did explain the structure to me when I was talking with him. So it goes formella and then it goes miles. Right. With him being the chief senior assistant attorney general, both homicide and cold case are underneath him. So to put that into perspective, Jane, like when Straussen was in office, he would have been underneath Miles. Okay. Yes. So once once that structure was explained to me, I sort of understood. Don't get me wrong. Yes. Would have loved to have seen Formella there. Of course, I would have, especially since on August 5th, he was quoted in an article saying that we were open to meet with him that day. (laughs) And I called him out on that um, at the podium, too. Um, But once that structure was actually explained to me, I think a piece of this is to like understanding what the structure is and who is actually responsible for what to make sure that we're talking with the right people or getting to the right people as well. There's such a tree in that office as far as who's responsible for what. And you figure somebody like Mike Garrity, his job really is trying to be that, I'd almost say like a peacemaker between multiple departments, not just between advocates in the AG's office, but I'm sure he's doing that same sort of stopgap work between, say, the AG's office and another state department being the director of communication. So for him being there, yes, he's going to be the one that would be the best one to at least take our message in bringing it to Formella in a way that Formella can grasp all the grievances. I would say if being besides being Formella, he would be the best one for that sort of position. And I know that when I was talking with him, I did bring up the the press release that was released on WMUR Monday night. Yeah. And I told him, this is a key example of some of the grievances. You put out this email to WMUR. You had the email addresses to our coalition. If you had just copied us on that with that original press statement where we could read it from you directly and not have to hear it through the media, that would have gone a long way to every single one of these advocates going, at least they're communicating to us. But I was like, but when that press release came out and everybody heard it for the first time through WMUR, it was like, well, once again, they're not communicating to us. They're communicating to the media. So just that little thing, and I could see it almost like with Mike going, all right, that's a valid point. There was just one additional step that we have, if we had done, it would have gone a long way to everybody that's here. And it's something that is so small and simple, but they didn't even think about it. So, yeah. Yeah. I think what irritated me the most about that whole press release that they put out was they felt the need to put in that press release their statistics for solving murders in 2022 and compare those numbers to the national average. Now, I'm sorry, but by you putting out there in the same response that you're supposed to be making to us or about the, about the march. Now, remember... All these cases that have to do with the march are unsolved, unsolved cases. They put in this press release all these numbers and talk about all the statistics about 
how they solved all these murders. And I was like, how disrespectful that was to all of us at that march standing there advocating for all these unsolved murders and missing persons. I thought that putting those statistics of solved murders in that statement was a slap in our faces because that doesn't change, even though they solved all this stuff, that doesn't change the fact that they still have 300 and 11 unsolved missing persons in New Hampshire. That's what we care about. We don't care about the ones that you solved. We don't give a shit about that. Those are solved. Those are done. What we cared about was the ones that were unsolved. And that's why we were there. I, I, I just felt like it was so disrespectful and in our face. Seeing the damage control that they were doing ahead of time definitely it showed that yeah. we were making noise and they were at least hearing that we were coming. I totally agree with you, Jane. I mean, you <laughs> you and I actually read, we were just finishing up at Machina Arts <laughs> on Monday night and you and I sort of, you know, read the WMUR report at the same time. We saw that and then we saw the written press release and it just really hit both. But both of us got really pissed. And oh, yeah. we both went home and reworked what we were going to say the next day. I do agree with you. It was received completely wrong from us. Um, I understand what he was doing. And again, as you just mentioned, Drew, I understand the damage control. We made a lot of noise. Media outlets were covering what we were doing. There were multiple articles that were written beforehand. And so I understand that they felt that they needed to defend themselves. I understand that from their perspective. But again, bring in a piece of the compassion with what we're standing for and what we're advocating for. Um, I agree that the percentages did not need to be there. I understand why they did it, but I don't think that that needed to be there in that press release. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, That did not need to be there. And we also do want to clarify that those stats that were in the article, just stats, not the raw data. Once again, how many male bodies are showing up in the Merrimack River over the last couple of years that are just labeled as not suspicious, so therefore are not going to screw up the stats. And another point, I don't have the exact date, and actually, Drew, maybe you can pop on to the cold case website real quick and see when the last update date is on the cold case website. So the first original figure that we put out there of 130 unsolved and missing in the state of New Hampshire came directly from the Department of Justice cold case website. That website has not been updated in at least a few years. And with a point that you just brought up, Drew, about the not suspicious bodies in and around the Merrimack River, that problem that has existed for at least the past few years, with them not being suspicious, with them being possibly labeled as drowning deaths, even though, were they? How many years does it have to go before it's considered a cold case in the state of New Hampshire? It's not about how many years. It's it's about if they've investigated, exhausted every lead, and they stopped getting leads in, and they have no um, suspect to investigate. Once they've exhausted all leads, then it turns to cold case, and then it goes in the cold case unit. I think most of them are at least 10, if not 15 years old and older cases. So for annual reports, the latest the latest status report was from 2017. Yeah, for some reason it was stuck in my head that it hadn't, that that website actually hadn't been updated in about five years, or at least yeah. that's what it looks like. Yep, so the most yeah. recent unsolved homicide on the cold case website is John Laby from 2011. Yeah, but then you got to look at how many unsolved missing and murdered cases right now in the state of New Hampshire is well over 300. Yep. Yeah, this is just the cold case unit victim list. And it looks like for the most part, it's a lot of unsolved homicides. There's only a couple missing. You know, that was another thing. Um, I think we've talked about it a few times, but 
Me, Amanda, and Drew feel like that there's a serious issue with bodies being discovered in the Merrimack River and other small rivers, too, in the state, but mostly the Merrimack River. And there was a lady there that her brother, his body was found. She was at the march. Her brother's body was found in the Kentucky River. And they saying that he drowned. And she is like not believing that at all. Was there a autopsy done or there wasn't an autopsy done? Because they didn't feel it needed to be an autopsy done or something. But she very strongly feels like her brother's death was numb. Should be ruled suspicious or a homicide versus not suspicious in a drowning. So that was interesting too because that's kind of confirming some of the things that we've been feeling over the, the past couple of years about all these bodies coming up. That's going to be another season. <laughs> I was going to say, that actually might be a completely separate podcast, guys. There's a lot there. That's there a lot. There is a lot there. We're going to have to employ a team to help us yeah, with that. Because I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be coming forward and saying, my brother or my sister or whoever has, their bodies have been found along the Merrimack River, that they should be ruled a homicide or suspicious, not, not, not suspicious. I have a feeling um, people are going to be coming forward with that, like, big time. That's another project. <laughs> but all in all, I, I think the march went great. I hope that we see a little bit of change. Um, you know, don't expect big change, but a little bit of change, baby steps. And I hope they'll listen to us a little more. I think that at the very least, scheduling and soon scheduling of this one-on-one -on -one communication direct in. So the specific questions that people have about the case that they're advocating for, that it is my hope that that one-on-one -on -one scheduling happens soon. Yeah. So we'll be monitoring that and making sure that that does happen. Yes, we will. And Drew, that documentary. Yes. How long do you think it's going to be before we actually see the finished piece it'll be a bit at the soonest maybe six to eight weeks but we'll see i know that maybe with people knowing that he's doing and has done this documentary um and all the the research and everything he's put into it i just thought some people may are listening or are saying eh, any kind of timeline when this is gonna happen and so i thought i'd throw that out there Gotcha. Have we, Thank you. Have we put a title on it yet? Voice for the Voiceless. Awesome. Love it. Because I think that's what the march mostly captured was we were all advocates there giving those that don't have a voice a voice. We need to make sure that these cases don't get forgotten. I don't care if it's a high profile case. I don't care if it's got very little media. I don't care if it's like... Tina and Bethany Sinclair, where their advocates have passed away, we need to make sure that these cases are not forgotten. Because if we forget them, they forget them. You know, th this gentleman, this uh, Michael Garrity, he came up to me and he had no idea about my case and what happened to me. Never heard about my case. And my case was a pretty high-profile case for a long time. And he never heard about my case. He never heard about the Connecticut River Valley cases. Which, talking with him, he was taken back of almost like a, how am I a part of this AG's office and I have not heard about this? Yeah. It was one of those where I was like, when talking with him, I didn't actually necessarily put the fault on him. But it was more on the, hey, when you're working for the AG's office, what is there some you know, historical stuff to know. So it was more of a, the AG's office not, isn't even talking about it. They don't really care. So that was how, that was how I took it is he did seem really taken back with, with your story, with the Trish Haynes story, with a couple others that he was like, you could see the look on his face when Trish was, or when uh, Val was talking about Trish being cut up and put into a washer and dryer. You could see that look of, holy shit, this actually happened in New Hampshire. How did this happen? And how is it not? How has it not been solved? So at least that was the the look on his face when when talking about Trisha's case in particular. So Yeah. 
I think that's where where it comes in, where we we cannot let these cases be forgotten. That's what we use in our podcast for invisible tears. We're not going to let these cases be forgotten. And we are going to start contacting some of the ones or all of them that were there to let them come on if they want to come on to our podcast and and tell their loved one's story. Yep. I mean, whether they want to actually come on or not, at least connect in with them and learn all of the details that and all of the factual details in regards to the cases of, you know, their their friends and loved ones and actually find out more about the individuals themselves. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Invisible Tears. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast to hear all future episodes. This episode wraps up season three for us, but don't worry, only a short break and we'll be back in October. We will still be doing our reaction episodes to Dark Valley until that first season wraps up. When we come back, we'll have any updates on Jane's case, updates and coverage of other cases, and be sharing our experiences at CrimeCon. Click into our link tree too in the episode description to find and follow us on all our social medias. And it also links to our website, invisible-tears.com, where you can keep current on any events that may be coming up, read more about Jane and the team, and read more about all the Connecticut River Valley unsolved cases. If you want to learn more about my wellness practice, Guided Path Wellness, head to guidedpathwellness.org. There you can read more about me and my certifications, more about the Reiki and coaching services I offer both in person and remote, and read all about my products for sale that I make through the practice. Feel free to utilize the contact us section on the website with any questions or utilize that free 15 minute consultation booking button if you have any questions about what might work for you. Evil may exist in this world, but we will not let it win. See you next episode.